my name is Eduardo Svartlin, and I want you to think back about the last time you were at the aquarium. You were checking out the tropical fish tank when a large, giant white shark came at you with jaws wide open, ready to devour you. Ah. Were you scared? Well, no, right? Because there's a huge piece of glass standing between you and the shark, right? And as we know, sharks are not very good at crossing through glass walls. So, what I'm going to talk about today is the possibility of a shark actually getting through that glass wall and eating you. And what it takes is for the shark, uh, sorry, and what, what it would take for the shark to actually get to you. Now, in order for this talk to make any sense, I'm going to have to talk at the microscopic scale, which is to say things that are much, much smaller than us. And it is at that scale that a shark would actually be able to cross through that wall. So let's look at this problem, I'm sorry, from uh, a physicist point of view. Here's a shark, and here's little Ralphie, and this shark wants to eat Ralphie. Now the only way for the shark to get to Ralphie is by jumping over that energy barrier. Uh, and of course, the way to jump over an energy barrier is by acquiring energy. So the shark can go ahead, eat a lot of shrimp, um, get strong, swim really quickly, and trade off some of that energy he's gained by swimming very quickly by jumping up and over the barrier. And so he can eat Ralphie. Now, it would make sense to call this glass thing in the middle an, an energy barrier, right? Because unless you have enough energy, it's a barrier that separates Ralph from the shark. So, at the macroscopic scale, at our scale in which we live in, energy barriers are pretty boring things. A door is an energy barrier. If you bang up against a door, you'll bounce back and there's nothing to it. But once you start getting to very small scales, strange things start happening when you try to bang against energy barriers. So first let's look at what the microscopic world looks like. Here's our shark. And uh, if we zoom in about one million times, we start seeing stuff like this. Does anybody know what this is? Sorry. Yeah, that's right. These are red blood cells. And if we keep zooming in, we'll start seeing stuff like this. That's hemoglobin. It's the protein that carries oxygen around your body. If we zoom in even more, we'll see that, uh, protein, that this protein is made out of individual atoms. Here's a picture of a carbon atom. Carbon is, of course, the most abundant element in our bodies. And now there's something curious about this picture. It's no longer a nice little bundle of something. We actually see that it's something nebulous. And if you've taken a chemistry class, you know what that is. That's an orbital. It's a fuzzy picture of where the electrons on inside that uh, carbon atom are. So if we zoom in about a thousand trillion times, we can actually not see the clouds, but see the electrons. And it turns out that when we're that zoomed in, when we're just focusing on a single electron, the electron starts behaving strangely. It starts behaving like a wave, not like a particle. So a particle is like a gelatin, right? You throw it out a wall, well, it'll bounce back. But light is a little bit different. When light faces an energy barrier, it does not just bounce back. So let's consider this. Here is a glass prism. It's just a piece of glass that has this in, uh, interesting shape. And if I shine a laser through it, well, the laser is going to go through it. Now, if I put this laser at a slight angle, I'm going to see three different parts of, the way, uh, of uh, this light wave. I'm going to see an incident wave that is then bent as it is refracted across uh, uh, this space. And that's called the transmitted light. And then some of the light is reflected back, right? Now, if I keep increasing this angle, right, as I pull it down, I see that the transmitted light starts getting closer and closer to this uh, line over here, until eventually there is no transmitted light. Um, at this angle, called the critical angle, we have something called total internal reflection. Why? Because all the light is internally reflected. But here's something very unexpected. Let's put another prism very close to the first prism. What we'll see is that even though there's no wave in here, we will see another wave at the next prism. We have frustrated total internal reflection. What happened? Like, this light was not supposed to keep going, but it did. So let's look at it from the energy uh, terms. Here's a representation of a wave, right? And here's a representation of air, right? So this region is the prism, and here we have air outside of the prism. So what happens? 
we have the wave coming in, and eventually when the wave hits uh, the air, well, it still exists to a certain extent, but it quickly decays to nothing. When we add a second prism, right, well, it still hits, it still decays, but if the wall is thin enough, right, this is what we did, if the wall of air is thin enough, what we'll see is that the light can continue existing in the next prism. And that's wave behavior. It's completely different from the jelly bean. That doesn't happen with particles. So, let's talk about the electron. Here's an electron, which kind of looks like a wave, hitting an energy barrier, and that's mostly the situation we encounter on everyday life. Even a shark, it's kind of the same thing. There might be a tiny, tiny, tiny penetration of shark into the wall, but it's, but it's so small related to the size of the wall that the shark is not going to tunnel through. However, if the barrier is made small enough, just like the light wave, what we'll see is quantum tunneling. We will see that the electron apparently can go through this forbidden zone. This is like the shark biting you right through the glass wall. Apparently impossible at the macroscopic scale, but the microscopic scale, since things behave like waves, this is what we see. Now, you might be saying, well, this guy is crazy. This is useless. This is all, well, you can't even see these things. But as a matter of fact, it turns out that this is very useful. And what better way to demonstrate it than as a way for peering into the microscopic world? So here's a very cheap schematic diagram of something we call a scanning tunneling electron microscope. And the idea behind this is that you're going to shoot electrons and see how many can tunnel through this thin sample, which we're, you're interested in taking a picture of. So this shoots electrons. This is just a very small sample. And this is an electron drain, right? This just takes away all the electrons and counts how many have hit. So if we scan this, this electron gone through, we will see that in the thin section of the sample, there are very many tunneling electrons, and at the thick region, there are very few tunneling electrons. So if we take that signal and we flip it over, well, guess what? We've just found a picture of our sample, even though our sample could be so small that no light microscope could look at it. And using this technology, we've actually obtained images like this, which show a ring of individual iron atoms in a plane of carbon. This is absolutely amazing. Um, you, um, it is physically impossible to use light to image uh, things that are so small. But using the principle of quantum tunneling, we can actually come up with things like this. So, as a conclusion, um, well, what have we learned? That at the small scale, things start behaving a little bit differently. They behave like waves, not like particles. And, these, and this leads to strange things like quantum tunneling. The, obviously, the last thing I want to leave you with is that you should enjoy your next visit to the aquarium. There's no reason to be scared of a shark unless it's very small. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah? Why did you choose your presentation on sharks? So I was thinking about this and I'm like, well, what, would, you know, what am I scared of? And, I just read an article about somebody getting their leg bit off, and I'm like, ah, oh, sharks. <laughs> I have a question for you guys. Why do why do we have to go to such a small scale to observe quantum tunneling? Is there like is there a particular reason that we have to go to such a small scale? What do you think? It's a it's a, actually a mystifying question to physicists even, and the reason is that there's a constant called h, Planck's constant, and it just happens that it's a very tiny number. But if that number were about a million times bigger, you would actually start seeing ants or things about that size being able to tunnel. So we're not entirely quite sure why H is that small, but it just happens that we live in a universe where H is that small. Anything else? All right. Thank you. All right.